You might have been expecting uh, the Disability Discrimination Commissioner, Alastair McEwen, um, and so my hosting this event uh, tonight might feel like an elaborate game of bait and switch. <laughs> but if you haven't caught up on Friday's exciting news, uh, Al has been pointed, appointed uh, one of the Royal Commissioners to the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability and he is already preparing for that big responsibility. Al desperately wishes he could have been here tonight and it's an honour for me to stand in for him. On behalf of all my colleagues, we wish him well in his important new role. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting on the traditional land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay tribute to the elders past, present and emerging and particularly <laughs> acknowledge uh, any Indigenous people in the audience this evening. I'd like to also thank our co-hosts uh, at Human Rights Watch and of course the wonderful speakers who I will introduce very soon. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you need to use the bathroom, um, the ladies bathroom is immediately out this door and to your left. Uh, the accessible bathroom is on the other side of the lifts and to your left, left, and the men's bathroom is also on the other side of the lifts and to your left. Uh, when we come to ask questions um, later in uh, today's session, um, we will try and use a microphone if uh, that's possible. Uh, I lead the Commission's work on refugees and migration, and so this rights talk is a special privilege for me to participate in. Uh, in a moment, as I say, I'll introduce our two amazing speakers, but I would like to first provide a little bit of context. Every refugee is almost by definition a miracle. They have fled persecution and are somewhere on the journey towards enduring peace safety and a new life. Australia can be rightly proud of our multicultural ethos and the many success stories from refugees who have found security and success in our lucky country. But all too often, we who are safe make the refugees journey even more difficult and even more painful. In Australia, we detain anyone who arrives on our shores without a visa, even asylum seekers. I'm only going to give one statistic, but it's a really horrifying one. Worldwide, the median period that people are held in immigration detention is 20 days. But in Australia, the average period that someone will spend in immigration detention is currently over 500 days. Just think about that. Think about the many orders of magnitude more that we detain people, not because they've committed a crime, but purely because they're seeking asylum without a visa or for some other reason they don't happen to have a visa. This rights talk this evening links two experiences, being a refugee and having a disability. Until recently, in Australia, having a disability was grounds under our law for denying someone a refugee visa. And I'm very pleased that that law has been repealed. But for every other visa category, the Disability Discrimination Act simply does not apply. And so you can be refused entry into Australia because of your disability. I think that's shameful. And we at the Commission have long advocated for that barrier to be removed. Speaking more positively, our speakers this evening know what it means to overcome barriers. The first speaker will be Nujin Mustafa. Five years ago, at age 16, Nujin began a 5,600 kilometer journey from Syria to Germany in a steel wheelchair. She has since become a powerful advocate for refugees and people with disabilities. In her home city of Aleppo, Nujin never attended school. She taught herself English by watching American soap operas. 
There are so many things I've learnt from American soap operas. <laughs> English wasn't one of them. <laughs> in partnership with Human Rights Watch and others, Nujin has been instrumental in persuading yeah. the European Union Commissioner for Humanitarian yeah. Assistance to announce new measures to ensure that the delivery of humanitarian aid meets the needs of people with disabilities. Nujin will then be followed by Shantha Raupariga. Shantha is the founding director of the Disability Rights Division of Human Rights Watch. She leads research and advocacy on human rights abuses against people with disabilities worldwide, including the shackling of people with psychosocial disabilities, denial of education, violence against women and girls with disabilities, institutionalisation of children and adults with disabilities, and the neglect of people with disabilities in humanitarian emergencies. They have graciously agreed to being interrogated by me, and afterwards they'll have a few minutes to answer questions from you. So I'm going to start with some questions of you, Nujin. What was it like growing up as a child with disability in Syria? Well, let's say it was a um, three seconds of my life as a child with disability in Syria was unusual. Well, let's say I was, um, so I was born with this disability, which meant in my country that I could not attend school. Um, that when I lived in a five-story building, um, oh, with no lift. Um, so I guess you're now seeing the lack of, the lack of infrastructure uh, that we have. And I think, from, so I was forced to, <laughs> teach myself everything. First, um, when I was about six, my sister taught me um, um, how to read and write in Arabic. And then when I was about 14, it was time to learn English, so and I found that pretty good episode of Deus and I started <laughs> learning from the subtitles. But the thing is, it wasn't all, you know, all fun. You might, you might think, I mean, I was grateful for it too. Can, can you think about it? Like, no school, no school meant to me, like no homework, no, um, yeah, no stress, no, yeah, no, yeah, n none of the daily stresses that you complain about here, but which I um, wished for back then. Um, being deprived of my, my rights did not, um, define me as a person. Um, I lived in a very supportive environment. I had a very um, supportive family. It did not make me feel less. It, it, made, me, it made me feel like my disability made me more. And, but of course, there are some um, facts, that I have to, uh, facts that I had to live with, live with was that I was not the favorite playmate for any child around me, because I could not move and run around and go on a, a play on a swing. And that's, that's okay, I just surrounded myself with people who believed in me and, and did, not, did not think that I was something to be, you know, some burden or some kind of a, a, a less of a human being than any, any other person. Um, so, while I felt like that, I was like reading books, watching TV, teaching myself, you know, um, um, managing my life in one, in one way or another. Until the war broke out um, in 2011. And um, it just dawned, dawned on me how difficult my situation was. and. Um, of course, we feared that the, um, the army was going to break into our city, so we fled. Um, and that was, was the time when I realized, oh my God, this is, this is, yeah, this is big, uh, uh, but, I'm get, but I'm gonna do it. Um, I was, we were very determined to get to Europe, to get to that place which was going to give us another chance of life. We were sick of, of the bombings, of the anxiety, of everything that that 
yeah, that war imposes, imposes on you as a person. And especially for me, can you imagine like not knowing whether you're going to live tomorrow? And as a person with disability, you're even, even with my positive attitude and um, I don't care uh, mentality, was this, just that nagging feeling in the back of my head. What if, what if I, I was the reason uh, we fled one minute too late? And so we just went, yeah, so we just made the decision and fled. And that was a whole, a whole nother, on a whole nother level of difficulty, I think. Uh, so yeah, that difficult terrain in that steel wheelchair, I was bumping to it. My, my forearms are like, were, were, yeah, were red. And, um, and that, and to think that I was, I was doing this whole way to get so, to get somewhere where I could, you know, live live a better life for myself and and have an actual future that I can plan. You know, go you know the normal things, going to college, finding a job. Um, and then I was I was just shocked uh, by by the, how difficult it was for me. And but of course. Um, I tried to like be more positive about, about it. I, I mean, a person who's spent her whole life in a, f um, in a fifth floor apartment is gonna be excited about crossing Europe to get somewhere. <laughs> well, God, that's a that's a big adventure for me. But yeah, but some things you just cannot sugarcoat, like the like the, the uh, dinghy journey that I had. <laughs> I mean, I was quite aware that that water that I crossed from Turkey to, to, to Greece was might become my grave. But um, with prayers and tears, we made it, and I'm very thankful for that. So yeah, so that's up to that point. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you to tell us the next part of your journey? So you arrived in Europe. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what your experience was when you first arrived in Europe? Um, it was funny, great. So you arrive in Europe and you think you, everybody, uh, everything is here is gonna keep, get better and that everything, everything is gonna be okay. Um, uh, and then you are shocked with the response, oh my God, how did you bring her here? Oh, how did this happen? With a wheelchair? How is this possible? And I was told that I was actually the first person in a wheelchair that arrived in Greece. And I was like, oh my God, why are they so, so shocked? Do they think that my family is gonna leave me behind? Um, and yeah, that sounds very grim. I'm gonna tell you a funny story. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, when I was ba back home, I used to watch a lot of MasterChef Australia and they had like, like that delicious food. Um, that's just to expand my culinary vocabulary in English. And yeah, my, the first time which I had did not look like something from Master Chef Australia, let me tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, so so I so and I was yeah, you think that everything is gonna be better and you, then you, you're shocked that you can't actually find an, um any access to bed servants like the like the washroom or the toilet or anything. And that you're okay, gonna be yeah, you're gonna be thrown into a, a camp that had all where the ground was all gravel and you cannot actually move around. Um, and some people's conditions were even worse than me and they had waited for much longer than I did. So it was such a disappointment mm. when you when you have all these, when you've built all of that in your head where you, where you thought that everything is gonna be better now and you're faced with such, with the problems that could be solved by, by a ramp, you know? Just a ramp to get you where you want, where you need to be. Um, yeah, so that's that's been my experiences since I've arrived here. And let's not mention the the border, the borders that the borders that I've crossed ever since, and um, and the, all the dragging across the across the borders, all the um, interrogations, as you call them. Um, yeah, all the registration process and all the delays and all the calls that I had to make just to make sure that we were registered. Um, 
So yeah, that's been my experience. I'm glad. And I was just when we arrived in Germany in our destination, I was just so glad that it was, yeah, over. Like we had made it. It was actually funny because there was like this chalk, this um, this chalk like showing in Germany, like red chalk on the ground, and um, there were like um, arrows on the ground all the, um, uh, all the way along from the borders, you know, Austria and Germany. It's a very Hansel and Gretel-ish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got home, guys. Yeah. That's lovely. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions now, Shanta. Uh, my first question is, how did you two come to work together? It seems like a pretty wonderful partnership. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it has been a, a wonderful partnership. You've already gotten a glimpse uh, of what Eugene is like, uh, even just to hear her uh, share her story tonight. Uh, so when we were working on documenting abuses in Greece, uh, we, um, for refugees with disabilities, uh, in particular people from Syria, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, and we uh, were looking for people who could help us in that advocacy uh, because in all the work that we do, we very much are committed to the, the motto of nothing about us without us. And so we, while we were in Greece and we documented so many stories, we really wanted to find somebody who could work with us. Um, and so we partnered together with the European Disability Alliance uh, as well as Eugene and the humanitarian organization, the Norwegian Refugee Council, in a unique partnership. And we're pushing the European Union uh, to to do more to make sure that the response was inclusive. So what do I mean by inclusive response? You, you got some highlights from Eugene, but what we also saw, um, some other uh, testimonies that we documented, a young boy who was eight years old named Ali from Afghanistan. And when he got to the camp that, that Eugene also went to, he was in Moria camp, uh, which is a prison-like camp where people are continue to be held in, in really horrific conditions, which um, might not be so difficult, different to, uh, than what's going on offshore here in Australia. But what we, um, what we documented was that this young boy was, uh, wasn't able to use something as basic as the toilet. And as a consequence of having difficulty even just getting to the toilet, his mother pushing him along the way, having to pick him up and take him because there was no handrail, uh, she had no choice but to put him in diapers. And if you can just imagine what an eight-year-old must feel like and the indignity of that. We documented uh, the case of a, of a young man, Amin, who is from Syria, a deaf man. Uh, and, and along his journey uh, to Syria, uh, from Syria to uh, Greece, his hearing aid was damaged. And when he got to Greece, there was no support, there was no sign language. There was no ability for him to communicate. And so he told us that he preferred to just stay in the tent um, because no one understood him. And his father told us that you know, what, he, he now lives in complete isolation from everybody, even though he's in this camp with hundreds of people. So we documented so many stories like this, and we really wanted to push that the European Union did something about it. And the European Union, as you may know, is one of the largest funders in humanitarian assistance around the world. So we organized um, together this small coalition with Eugene, and we uh, held a briefing at the European Parliament in exactly two years ago yeah. and in Brussels. And we were fortunate that the commissioner, the European Union Commissioner for Humanitarian Assistance, personally attended this uh, briefing. He's the chief uh, in terms of all of the humanitarian assistance that the EU does. And in that, Eugene made a presentation. She made a plea looking directly at the commissioner. You want to share what that was? Yeah, um, of course, after looking at the report that Human Rights Watch had made and seeing all these horrific cases, I even had a much worse experience than I had had. It was just, I was just appalled. Oh my goodness, all these poor people, like, they have expected something much better. You know, they've hoped for so more. Yeah, so so I was like, I was I was nervous. I was sitting in the like um, in the in the EU like hall, and I was so nervous about it. But then, you know, I realized that I, if if nobody's gonna tell tell the commissioner what to, the commissioner what to do, nothing is gonna be better. So I was like, I looked at him and said, 
that I was, yeah, that I find it, I find it shocking and just, a, and just such a shame that in the 20, 21st century, in this day and age, um, like basic services are luxury for some people and that people have been through so much already, have just suffered through that again after going through horrific journeys just to get to safety. So it was unfair and we all deserved so much better. Okay. I have an addendum to that, if I may. Uh, yeah, and I'll just jump in there because I can say from personal experience and that commissioners tend not to be particularly quick on the uptake. So being direct, <laughs> giving them very, very clear advice is very useful the world over. Uh, but carry on. So after that briefing, uh, we followed up with the commissioner and his team. And it was exciting for him to share with us in a private meeting uh, at the end of 2016 that, uh, that, that they had committed, that the European Union was committing that all European Union funding for humanitarian assistance um, must now include how they must re report back on how people with disabilities will be included as part of that funding assistance. So we're talking about millions of euros, we're talking about countries all around the world, and when he met with us in, in that uh, meeting to tell us that, that he was going to soon announce that uh, this, this inclusive funding, uh, he told me that Nugene's testimony in that hearing had left a lasting impression, as I'm sure she'll leave on all of you tonight, uh, and that was part of his uh, encouragement to, to take, make this decision, which is really going to have a profound effect on so many people with disabilities around the world. Um, we've heard from both of you some of the really uplifting aspects of the story as well as some of the really worrying and, and horrifying aspects. I wonder if you, Shantha, given your work across many countries, I wonder if you can reflect a little bit on what some of the systemic impact of those barriers uh, is. What, what, what is that systemic impact and, and what do you see are some of the really intractable problems. Thank you. So I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour and talk about a, a few different countries and I'm going to start in Cameroon. Uh, we put out a report just a couple of weeks ago uh, on the fighting uh, that's taken, uh, that's emerged in the Anglophone part of Cameroon in, in uh, Central Africa. And as part of our regular work on documenting human rights abuses, we found that people with disabilities are among those impacted by the conflict, but their stories are quite invisible. We documented the case of one um, in one village where the government forces went in last uh, October and killed four civilians, including one young man with a physical disability who used a wheelchair. The other residents told us that uh, when the military came, uh, the, his grandmothers locked him in the house. Um, everyone fled uh, initially, but because he wasn't able to flee, his grandmother stayed behind and locked him in the, in the house. But when the military came knocking on the door, they, they pulled him out of the home and shot him. And he just lumped over out of his wheelchair. One of the people uh, in um, the situation we've documented in Central African Republic just next door as a young man named Andi. He's 27 years old. Uh, he also uses a wheelchair. And when the fighting broke out, no one was around in his village. Everyone had fled. And he got out of bed, crawled to the door, and was just shouting and shouting for help. And hours later, this little boy comes by. And he begs this boy to help carry him. And the boy did just that carrying him, a man, two or three times his weight, about three kilometers to the camp for internally displaced people. Uh, but once at the camp, it wasn't that Andy's experience was all that better. Uh, there were so many physical barriers that he experienced. Uh, even just to take a shower was difficult. Uh, and he also saw his family there uh, and asked them why they had fled. And and confronted them. Um, but of course, at that split second, when everyone, when you hear the gunshots, you know, families aren't necessarily, you know, leaving someone who's either a person with a disability or older person behind because of some ill intent, but it happens as a consequence of just the, 
the, the, the conflict. Um, but then in the camps, you, you hear, we document also a number of stories about um, how Andi and others would literally crawl into the toilets because the toilets were not accessible. In um, Bangladesh, we documented uh, the situation uh, in Cox's Bazar, where uh, thousands and thousands of refugees from Myanmar uh, are now living in very overcrowded conditions. Hilly, the, the camp is quite hilly and uh, rain-soaked. And walking through Cox's Bazar, my colleagues found a large number of people with disabilities. Uh, including uh, one young man, 17 years old. And his father told us that he had been shot in the neck while escaping and was paralyzed from the waist down. And he shared with us that you know, his son was going to be going to university, 17 years old, and yet he said, he's just lying here, his life wasting in front of me. The doctor has provided, the, the humanitarian organizations have provided a wheelchair for him, but you can't even use it because the roads and the passages here are just impossible to go on. So it was just, uh, um, he just laid there in their makeshift home uh, and with no education and with no other services. In, in, and, and there are so many stories like this um, and so many conflicts where people with disabilities are invisible, either during the conflict or in the effort. I must say, in, in almost all of these, we've been engaging with humanitarian organizations, and I think um, many of them, you know, in that kind of situation, is there's so many competing priorities, there's so much happening that you're trying to respond to, uh, and so we were quite aware. We, we're, it's not uh, uh, in any way a reflection on the the lack of. Um, will or the lack of good intent from humanitarian organizations or UN agencies. But what we found again and again, every time, every conflict, you meet someone uh, in the humanitarian space and you ask them, well, what are you doing for people with disabilities? How are they being included? We were just in the US-Mexico border the, where many um, uh, migrants are fleeing uh, to try to get into the United States. and. Every humanitarian organization we talked to said, uh, when we asked how are people with disabilities included, they said, we hadn't actually thought about that. When we asked uh, organizations working to set up education in refugee camps or camps for internally displaced people and said, how are the schools including kids with disabilities? They said, actually we hadn't actually thought about that. But then they'd always ask, so what, who should we talk to? What should we do? We, so I, so it's a matter of, I think, uh, breaking through some of this, uh, as the title of this event is called, you know, that the fact that people with disabilities are often overlooked. Um, but it's, and then trying to provide some expertise, and there are excellent experts around the world who do know how to make camps accessible, how to make programs accessible. Even just the toilets in the, is a very basic uh, issue. In so many camps I've been to, they're about you know, 10 centimeters off the ground, 20 centimeters off the ground. And instead, if they were just built at a lower level, then it serves everybody, people with disabilities, older people, someone who might have limited mobility from either from uh, an existing disability or something that they incurred along the way. And you know, there's, I think, a lot of momentum toward that. And there's a lot of uh, good practice that's being developed. But we're not there yet. And if you think about the statistics, it's one in seven people has a disability, right? It's one billion people around the world who have a disability, and yet they're still invisible when it comes to our societies in many countries, but particularly when it comes to conflict. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna open the floor up to questions uh, for all of you. Uh, but my next question um, requires a bit of local context. This one's for you, Najin. Uh, if you're a movie star and you come to Australia, uh, the first question you get from journalists at the airport is, what do you think of Australia? And there's only one legitimate answer that you're allowed to give, and, you're, and th that is, this place is fantastic. This is brilliant. Now, you've written a book, and at the Human Rights Commission, you are the equivalent of a movie star, but you are also invited to give a very honest answer to the next question, because... 
I have an inkling that not all movie stars like Australia as much as they claim to like it. <laughs> so what do you think about the refugee situation here in Australia? Um, I think it's absurd. Uh, as much as I love Australia, I'm going to be honest. Um, it's absurd. He has to rock day with nothing. Yeah. He just signed there of frustration. Yeah. So, people did not escape the, their areas of conflict or the problems that they were facing. Uh, and the presence they were in to, to enter a bigger one. And you have to, re to realize that these people, they, these people have placed faith and trust in their next destination. So how could you let them down like that? How could you put them in a prison where they would prefer death over it? How, how could you take away their rights, uh, the, right, the right to be a human? an actual act of a human in society. How could you take that right from them? God, I mean, this is absurd. These, these prisons have to be closed down. And you know what? Just give us our rights. Just give us what we need, and we will be fine. We will manage. We will, we will, be, we will be able to work our way through it and find a way to pay you back. We are not a burden on you. Don't. Don't look at it as a humanitarian crisis. Don't be, like, don't be, don't be kind. Be selfish. <laughs> do, do you know how, how much money these, like, these, um, these islands or these prisons cost? Mm. Too much. Like, use it for something else, please. Mm. <laughs> um, okay. So just, yeah, this is absurd. It has to stop. Stop it. That's nonsense. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Shantha, can you perhaps put Australia's situation in a global context? And one of the things that's um, been really striking to me, reading about the situation on Manus Island and Nauru, is the toll on mental health. Um, just reading about uh, the suicides and uh, imagining what it must be like, as you said, for 500 days locked up in these detention centers, uh, if someone didn't have a mental health condition going in, they probably do now as a consequence of what they've been through there in addition to the long, the treacherous journey that they must have all taken just to uh, try to find, as you said, you know, the hope and faith that they had in Australia. And, uh, and that's what's really worrying because we see that in many different parts of the world. I met in, in Greece um, a man from Afghanistan uh, who was a father of a four-year-old and he um, started telling me his story about how they came and was just weeping and weeping in front of me. And he was telling me about his four-year-old daughter who woke up, uh, started waking up with nightmares in the middle of the night because of the insecurity in the camps. She started wetting her be uh, the bed again, even though she had been potty trained and, and that anxiety was creating more stress and anxiety for him. And when we asked him if he had talked to anyone or sought any kind of psychosocial support, and he said no, he didn't know. He was also I think, a proud man from Afghanistan, but really uh, understood at that moment that he really needed to have some help and really needed to have some support. Um, I've interviewed people from different countries who've told me how they have suicidal thoughts uh, in places like Manus Island or Nara, you know, places of detention uh, for refugees and, and migrants, and how, how difficult that must be where they'd rather kill themselves than after all of that that they have risked and uh, all of the, the expense to them and their family, physically, mentally, financially, um, in making their way to a place they thought would be safe. And I think it's, there's so many levels on which Australia can address uh, and should address, as Nugeen said, that, that people on the islands need to come back. I think there are nearly 1,000 people still remaining on Nauru and Manus Island. And we, as Human Rights Watch, together with many organizations here, have been calling for them to close and for people, all people, 
uh, to to have a, an opportunity to be here on the mainland. I, I wanted to mention a, a report that came out that I thought was really a uh, very uh, interesting and helpful and strong report. I'm going to read off all the organizations that did this. The Refugee Council of Australia, the National Ethnic Disability Alliance, the Federation of Ethnic Community Councils of Australia, and the Settlement Council of Australia did a report that you might have seen in February 2019 uh, about the situation of people with disabilities once they came on the mainland. Um, and that doesn't seem like it's particularly going well either. There was one case in there that um, of, a, of a husband who was taking his wife uh, to the local sports club and by taxi and paying for the sports club admission and the taxi simply because the housing that they'd been offered was not accessible. Uh, and I think there's a lot that the Australian government can do both domestically to support those who have already come over, but also to make sure that those on the islands um, are no longer there. Um, so now is an opportunity uh, for all of you to ask questions. Um, I'm responsible for freedom of expression, among other things, at the Commission. Um, but you can have too much of a good thing. So given that there are a lot of people, if you can keep your question really, really brief, no statements, if possible, just questions, uh, that would be really good. And um, unfortunately, we've only got one microphone between all of us. Um, so um, you'll just have to wait a moment while one of my colleagues hands it up. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. My name's Renata and Eugene, I had the pleasure of reading your book about a year and a half ago and it really touched my heart. Um, I think I've been so impressed with how the work that UNICEF have been doing on humanitarian accessibility and making some of the refugee camps more accessible. And the SPHERE standards for including a chapter on disability inclusion. Um, and I know the Australian Aid Program has an emphasis on disability inclusion too. But it's quite interesting when we look at the aid programs versus refugee situations and we look at funding that might go to organisations like UNICEF versus funding that might not be going to refugee uh, responsible organisations. Not to say that UNICEF isn't doing great work, but I guess my question is, as a child, how did you find that, that camps were incorporating play or including more inclusive approaches and what would you recommend that Australia do to do more as well? And I, I know that that's a, a broad question, but I just was reflecting on your experiences. So, actually, I've seen, I'm used to that kind of, that's what I've been living with ever since I was born. Um, yeah, so they, so you're just there, and they, you're not, yeah, you're not considered in many situations. So I'm used to that. But in, in a recent trip to um, Iraq, of uh, um, northern Iraq, the Kurdistan region, and I just met met a young um, eight-year-old girl who had just had the same condition as, as I have. She had cerebral palsy, and she totally reminded me of my younger self. She was, um, so she was there without, you know, any help. Her mother had to do everything for her. She even had a chair outside the door just to, for her to look out, uh, look at the outside world. Kids playing and going to school without her being included in that. And, um, and even her brother who had, a, who had difficulty in speech has not, hasn't got any support. And that, that was a refugee camp that I had visited in the area, and even when I, when I wanted to talk to the administration, I could not get to the office without my brother actually carrying me because it was not accessible. So going, um, going back to your question, I think that my reaction to it is, is just, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it saddens, it saddens me that's so common uh, in places where you would think you would be considered. But I think that pushes me forward because that's what we do, right? Book people on the arm and shout their face and tell them that, okay, you need to, you need to consider people with disabilities. You, you cannot like ignore us. We are not, 
we don't want to be invisible. That's our right. We, yeah, we, we are yeah, one billion people around the world, so that's unfair. And that, you know, you as decision makers have to do something about that. Um, so I think, yeah, so that, that pushes me forward. That uh, ignorance uh, tells, me, tells me that I have to do more. I have to tell people that I am, that, that people with disabilities are not just their disability. I'm, disability. I'm, I'm called Nujin, not the girl on the wheels, you know? So, and that we are capable of so much more and that we could be of huge benefit to our communities and societies and that we, yeah, there's so much, so much potential that you're wasting on, on maybe war funding, which, which should never happen. So, yeah, so, yeah, so when I see that lack, it just push, pushes me forward and uh, motivates me to say, to say more and to shout at people and tell them, okay, guys, you need to work on that, okay? <laughs> so, this has to stop and we should no longer be ignored, so that's it. I think that's my view on the issue. Thank you for coming and speaking with us. I have a friend in Eastern Europe, and I've been discussing with her uh, how the people near her perceive the situation with refugees. They are afraid that uh, refugees come and there are some terrorists there and make a problem in the countries like in Western Europe. What would be your... Um, response to someone who is afraid in this way. Well, tell her that I understand. It just needs to come closer. We're not, just because I speak differently, I desperate differently, I believe in a different thing, does, does not make me different. I want the same, th every refugee wants the same thing as every normal person in, Western, Western or Eastern Europe, everywhere in the world. I want to have a job, I want to have a life, I want to, my kids to have a future, and just tell her that we are not parasites. A refugee, actually, by definition, means uh, some person needing your help. It's not, um, it's not a disease, uh, an infection. We are not, you know, parasites that it's going to feed off um, the hosting body. We are just, we are actually, we're trying to pay, pay back the favor and be productive and benefit the countries that we are, that we are residing in currently. So please uh, tell her to come closer because she will, she will notice that we are much, much more alike than ever, than uh, everyone thinks. And tell her not to listen to politicians. <laughs> <laughs> You may have heard, we've got an election coming up in the next <laughs> month or so. I don't know if you want to stick around because I think you get a lot of votes in this room. <laughs> um, we've probably got time for two last questions. So we might, uh, if there are two people still to go, we might take the two questions together. Um, there's one at the front. And if you can keep the questions really, really brief because I'm pushing the time. Um, my name is Didi Janavis Kutsanaris and I'm the chairperson of the Multicultural Disability Advocacy Association of New South Wales. I came here when I was old in 1954 and I have a hearing impairment and I can understand what you went through and what I went through here as well at the time. And it's unfortunate because whether you're a refugee or a migrant, you're going to a country and you never seem to belong because it was strange and everything. I'd like to congratulate you for what you've done because I think this gives other people the courage, you know, to stand up and talk about, you know, things that are wrong in our community. We have thousands and thousands of people who are disabled in the community. I have been working in the field for 45 years and I'm now retired and I remember that people didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. I remember as a child, 10 years old, I used to go to interpret for everybody in hospitals, courts and whatever. 
And that depends on my life of trying to change the system. And I think everything that each one does who do change the system. The system is very difficult. Now, I have, an, I, I, my wife is 96 years old. Most of the migrants at the time who could not understand, who could not speak, are now suffering from post-traumatic disorders. Mm -hmm. I'm a psychologist by training, but I've been working in the field and not individually. And there is nothing there. I tried to help my mother and other of my mother's friends there is a huge need out there who do not try to help the people. Now, I know the government is trying to help, but then they fund the services and then suddenly they think for economic rationalism, we have to cut the funding and leave us in the middle of the thing. And some of the programs that are really successful, you know, are destroyed and we have to start from point one. So people with disability are having a difficult time still. I know we've got the national, international bodies, so I fought for that. I know we've got the national bodies, the Disability Act and everything, but then they are not implemented in the community. Mm -hmm. So we all have to get together. I'm sure you all of you who must be working in the welfare or the disability field. We have to speak up. We have to help our people with disability so that we have to tell the government it's their responsibility to help the people and not to people that help themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Nujin, you've been invited to become the first person with disability to address the United Nations Security Council. What will you tell them? I would tell them that, um, I would tell, maybe I would just, yeah, just address a bit of the difference, what it means. What it, uh, what it means to be a disabled person in my country and what it means to be um, a disabled person here in re um, regions like Australia and Europe and, um, and the big difference between them. But what we all have in common is, that, is our need of a chance is our need for, for that belief and faith, is our need for that safety, that, that so, so many people with disability are deprived, uh, deprived of, uh, just because, yeah, uh, just because politics is crazy or that there's a civil, a civil war, as, as, it, as, it, as the case is in my country. So we need, we just, we, do, uh, we want nothing, just the ability to, dr to dream and, to hope and to look uh, forward into the, that future. What? Yeah, and the thing is, I'm a, I'm a big fan of history, and uh, what I qu quite often notice in all these documentaries that I watch on, you know, all the different channels, and they, they start talking about the, how smart this tragedy was and winning the war, and how this general was was terrific. Um, or the other one was was a bit of a dictator, but nobody actually nobody actually talks about the people. Like they are, they are counted. Like oh, 50 were were um, 50,000 were injured. Yeah, 100,000 were killed, and I don't I don't want to end up I don't want to end up in a registry. I want people to know that when they read that report, when they see that say that piece of news, that behind every piece of news you read, there is a person with a life and a vision and, um, and dreams um, and a life he has to build. It's not, so we're not numbers, we are human. That, that's what I would like to say. What a wonderful way to end uh, this evening's um, talk. Uh, I just have a couple of last things to, to mention to all of you. Um, the first is, um, it's a bit of a tease, but at the front of the, um, the, the room, there's a copy of Nushin's book. Uh, we only have one copy, um, and we're not gonna give everyone one page. But if you're interested in hearing more about her story, 
uh, you can uh, buy the book online and in some of the best uh, book stores, um, bricks and mortar bookstores, for as long as there are bricks and mortar bookstores. Um, I'd particularly like to thank uh, Shantha and, of course, uh, Nujin. Nujin mentioned uh, the importance also of family, and I know that you have a family member here in the audience, Nisreen. Uh, I'm sure she's not going to thank me for drawing attention to her, but we're really honoured to have you here as well. And I also, I also need to acknowledge uh, my own um, metaphorical family. Uh, the, an event like this um, takes a lot of people working really, really hard. So I would particularly um, like your indulgence in thanking um, some of my colleagues. There are many, many here, but I particularly want to draw attention um, to Aditi, to uh, Liz, to Sophie and to Lauren, who have all worked particularly hard um, in putting this event together. So thank you all very, very much. But, but finally, um, I'd like you to all join me once again in uh, acknowledging the truly amazing work um, that both uh, Shantha and Nujin do. Um, and among that really, really important mission um, is uh, the work that you do in explaining so powerfully, so eloquently your experience, your practical experience, and also what we can do to be our best selves. So thank you all very much. <laughs>